There are two clefs, treble clef and bass clef. I can see why you might think that, but it's wrong. There's also tenor clef and alto clef between them. This is elementary music theory. There's only two. Well, there's more to music than what you learned in elementary school. Nice try, but I know. Everyone is either bass clef or treble clef. That's oversimplified. A lot of people read multiple clefs and some don't read any at all. The bottom line is there are experts in music and they unanimously know that you're not correct. Experts in music? What is there to know? Just because you don't know very much about it doesn't mean that there isn't stuff to know about it. I'm gonna keep saying that there's only two clefs. If you're just gonna keep ignoring everything I say, I'm gonna stop talking to you. So you're just gonna shut me out for having a different opinion. We need to let children be whatever they want to be. What if they want to be conservative? Not that. Correct. Well, yes. I stand by that. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. That is a, that's a call for genocide. No, it's not. It's absolutely a call for genocide. You are asking that every single Israeli Jewish person get removed from Israel. So if that's a genocide, then what is Israel doing to Palestinians? Oh, uh, not genociding them. Israel's killed over 30,000 people. Yeah, but we like warned them. We told them to move away from the bombs. You told them to go from the north of Gaza to Rafah and the ones who listen survive. Okay, so then why is Israel now bombing Rafah? Well, we warned them to go somewhere else. Anywhere else is in Egypt because Rafah is literally the southernmost point of Palestine. Yeah, it should be on countries like Egypt to house them if they're going through things that are terrible. So you acknowledge it's terrible. No, but you're telling them that they need to leave now or they're going to die. Yes. So let me get this right. From the river to the sea is a call for genocide. Yes, because they want to get all of the Israelis out of Israel. But getting every single Palestinian out of Palestine is not a genocide. Yeah. Do you ever think to yourself that maybe the reason that you're afraid of Palestinians committing genocide against Israelis is because you think that they're going to treat you the same way Israelis have treated them? Why would you say that? Maybe, I don't know, because you're more afraid of a hypothetical genocide than the one that you've watched unfold in real time? Of course I'm afraid of them turning around and committing a genocide against us. Turning around as in you acknowledge that you're committing one against them? You're not weird for having feelings, everyone else is for acting like they don't. Toodles. A lot of people, specifically white and upper class groups, tend to see graffiti as no more than vandalization and random words on walls, but let's talk about how graffiti's roots have always been in either art or protest and why there's a racially differing perspective of graffiti. Graffiti's origin started in ancient Rome where citizens etched messages onto brick walls which created this new form of expression that then evolved into a tool for protest. Graffiti was used in the French Revolution to deface high-end art. It was used in South Africa to help demand the release of Nelson Mandela. The Berlin Wall was commonly used as a canvas for activism too. Graffiti, especially in the United States, reclaims public spaces for those who have been systematically excluded from them. That's why we so often see graffiti in the urban cores of cities where people of color are constantly being pushed out. Kind of like these abandoned luxury apartments in LA that were spray painted near Skid Row amidst a big housing crisis. It's a great example. But to rewind, in the 1970s when graffiti artists officially unionized for the first time, those with wealth responded by encouraging graffiti, but only within the high-end art world. They began to amplify select artists with the sole purpose of earning money and curating for the elite. And as you can imagine, the graffiti that was amplified was more often than not simply just art made by white artists who tended to be disconnected from using graffiti as a tool for protest for underserved communities and communities of color. That's the reason why even today, excluding non-male, non-white artists from museums is so common. According to a Data USA study, 85.4% of archivists, curators, and museum technicians are white, meaning that they continue to choose the artists and the art that they deem to be important, which is why 85% of art pieces in all major US museums belong to white artists as well. So even though graffiti's origins are rooted in protest, it was quickly decided that only graffiti made by white artists is the graffiti worth praising, leaving the graffiti we see currently in most modern major cities regarded as no more than vandalism, even though the work is the exact same. But if I have to worry about genocide, then I have to worry about the gentrification in my city. And then I had to worry about the Native Americans, and then I had to worry about every- Ah, you're so close to the point, and you're going right over it. It's 
it's insane it's maddening hysterically ill sick and twist you should be worrying about everybody you should because we're all being oppressed by the same systems that's gonna kill us all you should be worried about the native americans you should be worried about the gentrification you should be worried about the genocide because at some somewhere in all of that all of those issues that seem completely unrelated they all connect they all align somewhere somewhere whether it's capitalism or racism or white supremacy they they all align if i have to care about genocide then i have to care about everything else it's almost as if you should care it's almost as if empathy shouldn't just be a one-time thing for your favorite buddies or your favorite celebrities your favorite singers I can't stitch this video, but this dude is talking about how they're mad that they left out Hobie's lipstick. His lipstick. <laughs> Someone said he doesn't wear lipstick. It's an art style decision. Someone else said I didn't even notice he, wear he wears black lipstick on his top lip until I looked it up. This is what he looked like in the movie. His top lip is darker than the bottom one. And I'm assuming this is what he looked like in the comic. Top lip darker than the bottom one. Do you guys see this photo? You guys see how the top lip is darker than the bottom one? My top lip is darker than the bottom one. So when I read he doesn't wear lipstick, it's an art style decision. I didn't even know he wears lipstick. You've got to be kidding me ain't no way have you never seen a real negro in 1940 hattie mcdaniel became the first black person to win an academy award but because of racism the ceremony was segregated meaning that she couldn't even sit with her co-stars and that same racism is the reason that black media goes under awarded underfunded and underpromoted. so here are 10 black led tv shows and movies that you should already be watching rustin starring coleman domingo if you're under the impression that black history and lgbtq history aren't the same thing watch this film origin by ava duvernay which tells the true story of isabel wilkerson's writing of her best-selling book cast Anjanu Ellis Taylor crushes it in this film, and if you want to feel both hopeful about humanity but have a deep visceral experience, watch the film. Till, based on the real life of Mamie Till Mobley and her son who was brutally murdered, Emmett Till. It's true to history and an excellent watch. One Love, the Bob Marley film produced by his son Ziggy Marley and starring Lashana Lynch and Kingsley Benadire. Get your tickets right now, it's literally in theaters, it's fantastic, no notes. Sisters from Tyler Perry, an amazing show that elevates and celebrates black womanhood. They're currently on season seven, it's incredibly bingeable, I watched an entire season in one weekend, and it stars my friend Novi Brown. Avid Elementary by Quinta Brunson. If you want to watch phenomenal television and also get a little slice of what it's like to be a teacher in an underfunded system, check out this one. Survival of the Thickest by Michelle Buteau. And it just got greenlit for season two. There's drag queens, there's celebrations of bodies. It's just good. Go see it. And we have black-led television shows for the littles too. Lila in the Loop out now on PBS Kids, Tab Time from Tabitha Brown, and from Snoop Dogg, Doggyland. It's worth watching just for the affirmation song alone. Shout out your favorite shows and movies in the comments below and make sure to diversify your watch list. I don't think men just hate women, I think they hate femininity as a whole. And I think them more than any other demographic are transactional when it comes to their appreciation for other people. They have to have some sort of sexual arousal or some sort of relatability to the person that they're perceiving in order to treat them like a human being. I think all these facts are gone unseen by men themselves because they lack self-awareness because the society is gun-ho on blaming women for every single issue that ever happens in this world. Not to mention, most men are not even that tough. They're just extremely sensitive and they want to hide it behind the fact that they're just trying to uphold core values. Because why is another man painting their nails so bad to you? Why does it bother you so much? To me, that's pretty soft. Also, along with the fact that they have dark humor until the dark humor affects them, 
They're also hyper individualistic, but they want every man to act like them. If you don't wear the same shoes, if you don't wear the same type of clothes, if you paint your nails, like I said before, they come after you in the most vicious way possible. But at the same time, if you bring up real issues to care about, then they all of a sudden go blank. They don't want to spend the energy and time uplifting or protecting people. They want to spend time acting like everybody who doesn't act like them is somehow subhuman. And then when those same people call them out on their bullshit, they play victim and say that everybody hates men. No, it's just that your guys' ideology is so hypocritical and convoluted. I'll stand on the most trivial things and expect us to take y'all seriously. So have y'all seen this viral clip of Kenneth Owens getting owned at one of her debates? Because it illustrates how the violent and hateful transphobia from conservatives is built off of ignorance, white supremacy, and historical revisionism. But I mean, um, I th I think can you explain to me what Two Spirit is in the history? I'm telling you that not only in one Native American tribe, but in multiple tribes, there were dozens of terms that referred to people yeah. that would now be considered trans, and that was hundreds of years ago. So I'm just wondering why you think that people are only trans now because okay. the media is telling them to be. Well, I told you, because of the proliferation. So you can't just go from having 0% to suddenly 25% right, of I'm people. what I'm saying is that these people were around yeah. for thousands of years. Well, what you're saying is that some Native American tribes had people that would be considered trans today, that something that we can't trans. fact check because they're dead. It's right? historical knowledge. It's historical documented. knowledge that there were trans Native Americans? Yes. I, I really don't think that's historical knowledge, but here's, here's what I'll, I'll answer. Then. I don't think that there were, that there were, there were well, trans Native Americans. Were, so if you oh, could educate oh. yourself a little more, you would know that okay. as well. I will educate myself. And to be clear, Kenneth Owens is completely wrong. Two-Spirit refers to individuals who neither identified as men nor women since pre-colonial times in North America, and their existence is very well documented. On top of that, Native Americans are not all dead, and many today identify as Two-Spirit. Now, it's important to know that conservatism thrives on rhetorical attacks against aspects of society that are deemed new or recent, and also romanticizes aspects of society that are older or more traditional. As a clear example, Make America Great Again was a slogan for both Donald Trump and Ronald Reagan because it romanticizes the idea of upholding a set of traditional values from the past. But just to be clear, there's no inherent logic to this worldview, which is why conservatives were the champions of conserving things like slavery and Jim Crow. But that being said, it's clear that the same tactic is being used by conservatives to demonize queer and specifically trans people by attaching trans identity to some sort of recent media agenda or new social contagion. This hateful line of thinking is what has exacerbated discrimination against LGBTQ plus individuals and drove the brutal assault of a Native American teenager named Next Benedict, which led to their death. And may Next Benedict rest in power. But perhaps the worst irony behind all of this is that it's based on historical revisionism and lies. Even when engaging with a conservative worldview, it's clear that many homophobic and transphobic people are completely ignorant of the history of these identities. People that would now be considered trans or queer have existed across the world and throughout time. In India, third gender individuals or hijras have been documented in Hindu holy texts for over 2,000 years and were revered and respected in their society, including by rulers from other religions, specifically Islam. In some of the oldest societies of the world made up of the aboriginal peoples of Australia, there are sister girls and brother boys who represent ideas of gender that are even hard to conceptualize with the limited western perspective on the man-woman binary. And last but not least, yes, Africa is a continent full of examples of civilizations that included people that did not exist within the man-woman binary, including the Mudoko Dako of Mande Uganda and the Jinbanda of Central Africa, but there are so many more examples. In fact, PBS has a map detailing much of the gender diversity that exists across the world showing that no, queer and trans identities existing is nothing new. But what is more recent, however, is the transphobia and homophobia brought forth by colonization and imperialism that demonize and criminalize these identities. And what I find incredibly sad is that because historical revisionism and fundamentalism are so prevalent in colonial societies like the United States, some people who are woke on other issues actually believe that being trans is something new or some sort of novel deviation from the norm. The conservative superintendent of Nexus District in Oklahoma illustrates a perspective that many people have when he says, there's not multiple genders, there's two. That's how God created us. The left is undermining the very principles that made this country great, our Judeo-Christian values and our traditions in this country. And even though he declares himself a lover of history, it's clear that the superintendent only knows history through a lens of white supremacy and Christian hegemony. Like Kenneth Owens, he must be completely ignorant of the vast gender diversity that exists and has existed across the world, otherwise he would realize that his statement is just not based in any actual human history. The only credit I'll give him is that there is a clear analog between the work that he's doing and the work of the founders of this country. Because just as they sought to violently erase the cultural heritage of the 
peoples they subjugated, conservatives today are continuing to suppress and demonize identities that were openly expressed across many of our ancestors before colonization. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments and follow for more. Do you think Israel has the right to defend its borders? I think Israel has a responsibility to protect those that it occupies. <laughs> I think you have to ask that question differently. Um, you know, uh, Noura Arakat uh, wrote uh, a tremendous article on this from a legal perspective. You know, when you talk about Israel defending itself, um, Israel is bound to occupation law. This is the problem all along. You know, when 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 John Kerry said, of course, the, the U.S. is great sometimes at issuing inconsequential statements that Israel has to choose whether or not it wants to be a Jewish or a democratic state, be a Jewish or a democratic state, but it can't be both. Um, Israel wants to occupy and deny and at the same time not be held to the standards of being an occupier, but be treated as if it's some normal uh, state. Uh, those borders were drawn across occupied land and have been expanding into Palestinian territory and people have been thrown out of their homes systematically and transgressed upon even to the in the places that they fled to, which is Gaza, right? So when you talk about Israel having a right to defend itself, you should be talking about Israel's duty to protect everyone under its occupation, either lift the occupation or protect everyone under your occupation. Uh, where are your borders, right? What What is... Uh, your responsibility. Who are you protecting? And I think that it speaks to the fact that Israeli policy considers Palestinians to be animals. They say as much and they do as much. I've spoken about James Baldwin um, and James Baldwin talked about this pious silence surrounding Israel that we're supposed to pretend uh, like it's just another state, uh, you know, and, and ignore how it came into being and what it functions as. And I think that pious silence has to be broken. You know, I, I remember uh, John Stewart when he had The Daily Show several years ago, and he talked about this uh, policy of, uh, you know, we have to defend ourselves. And if, if someone was attacking your home, what would you do? And uh, the response was, well, why are you forcing people into a closet? So you force people into this desperate situation. You, you drive them out of their homes, claim their homes, and... Uh, then say that you're defending yourself against them. The default is that an occupied people have a right to defend themselves. The occupier is obligated to those that they occupy. Can you speak to this term occupation in Gaza? Because the people that say it is not an occupation say that Israeli troops have been pulled out from there before October 7th for many years. Yeah. And to you, it still is a de facto occupation. Israel doesn't get to set the terms and then define them. Uh, it is an occupation according to any uh, legal standard, international legal standard. Israel controls the movement of everyone in Gaza. It controls the air and the seas. Uh, it controls the ability to import or export. The people that live in Gaza and the people that live in the West Bank, the Palestinians have had their identity stolen from them. So there's the freedom of movement, there is the freedom of thriving, there is self-determination. All of that has been stolen from the people of Gaza. There's no airport in Gaza that was destroyed by Israel as well. Uh, it is an occupation uh, at, at, at every level and by any meaningful legal determination. Honest question, genuine question. Why don't leftists care about masking? Why aren't supposed radical, socially conscious people, why aren't they masking? Like, we're in a full-on pandemic raging, disabling hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions. We care about liberation, but not for the disabled. I, I just, I don't, I genuinely do not understand the dissonance. We claim to care about communal safety, but like not about community when it comes to a virus that's spreading and acts like HIV in a lot of ways. COVID, it's a damaging virus. It's truly a damaging virus. And the denial and the passivity of leftist people in masking, I just, I, I can't, I can't grasp it, man. Our government has lied to us about everything, but they haven't withheld things about COVID. Like COVID's the thing that we can trust them on. I'm at a loss, I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm just, I just don't get it. <laughs>